Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Weeknights at 8 on Talk TV. And good afternoon, I'm Ian Collins and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and of course on your smart speaker. Coming up today, a dangerous climate of harassment and censorship is threatening free speech. That's the stark warning from one of the government's most senior advisers. We'll look at that in a few moments. Chinese cyber hackers have targeted multiple top MPs as the government prepares to officially blame China for illegitimately accessing millions of British voters' personal details. And King Charles inspired the Princess of Wales to open up about her cancer diagnosis to the public. But will the Windsors open their arms to the Sussexes for a royal reconciliation? We'll look at that later too. And of course, it's your call. This show is all about your responses and your opinions. We're asking this question. Do you agree with Dame Sarah Khan? Is freedom of speech under threat? from harassment and censorship. Lines are now open. 0344 499 1000. You can text 87222 or on the socials at Talk TV. All of that's on the way, but first, let's get the latest news headlines from Divian. Good afternoon. In breaking news, the UN Security Council has passed a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. It comes as the US shifts its position by abstaining from voting. The resolution also demands the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages. MPs who've been targeted in cyber attacks are calling for the UK to stand up to China. Sir Ian Duncan Smith says he and his colleagues have been subject to hacking and harassment by the country and is calling for a new era in relations with Beijing. It comes ahead of a government announcement of a data leak involving 40 million voters last year. The former Conservative leader says the UK hasn't been quick enough dealing with it. So we should stand up, call them what they are, and then say, if you deal with us, you deal with us on the basis that we don't fully trust you. The question really is for us, it is really now time for us to recognise, particularly with what we may well be seeing uh, concerning the Electoral Commission stuff, that, that they are, have a malign influence and therefore they have become a threat. Four men have been charged with terrorism in Russia following a concert hall attack that killed 137 people. The men appeared in court in Moscow earlier. Islamic State says it was behind the attack. Today, the French president, Emmanuel Macron, said the same group attempted several attacks in France. The country's terror alert has been raised to its highest level. A review into the Nottingham attacks has found prosecutors could have handled the case better. Barnaby Webber, Grace O'Malley Kumar and Ian Coates were stabbed to death last June. The review concluded prosecutors were right to accept the killer, Valdo Calacane's manslaughter pleas. The Home Office has launched a social media campaign in Vietnam to deter migrants from coming to the UK illegally. The campaign will use adverts on Facebook and YouTube to target people who may be considering making illegal journeys to the UK. An increasing proportion of small boat migrants are Vietnamese. And a rare total solar eclipse will sweep across the US, Mexico and Canada in what's described as our planet's greatest spectacle. It occurs when the moon passes between Earth and the sun. This year it will be seen on the 8th of April, although the UK will be lucky to get a glimpse of a partial eclipse, depending on where you live. That's the latest weather time now with Nazanin Gaffa. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello. It's looking pretty wet out there for this afternoon, particularly across northern areas of the UK. We started off with the rain out towards the west this morning and it's been steadily moving its way northwards across parts of the UK. Now, there's some heavy downpour still to be had, particularly later across parts of the west of England and Wales. And as that rain hits the colder air sitting across northern parts of Scotland, particularly into tonight, there will be some significant snowfall over the high ground of central and eastern Scotland. For parts of eastern England, though, I think it will just about stay dry this afternoon with some bright or sunny spells and with the uh, light southerly winds it will feel pretty mild but feeling cool elsewhere although temperatures around average for the time of year. Now overnight as I said that rain steadily moves its way further northwards across the higher elevations of central and eastern Scotland there could be as much as 20 centimetres of snow this could cause some tricky driving conditions for tomorrow morning. Elsewhere we're seeing rain across the uh, north of England over Ireland and Northern Ireland and some showery rain starting to push up tomorrow morning across central and southern parts of England 
as well as for Wales. But for northern and eastern England, I think we will see some sunny spells tomorrow afternoon and it should become drier and brighter for Scotland too. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. And good afternoon. Now, free speech, the cornerstone of any democracy, is under siege in the United Kingdom. A warning from a senior government adviser, Dame Sarah Khan, has brought the issue into sharp focus in a report highlighting the disturbing trend of what she calls freedom-restricting rest harassment. Dame Sarah paints a troubling picture of a society where individuals from teachers to journalists are facing the threat of rape, death and abuse simply for expressing their views. Consider the case of the teacher in Batley in West Yorkshire, forced into hiding after using a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad. This incident is just one among many illustrating the dangerous climate of censorship and intolerance gripping our nation. The report comes amidst heightened concerns for politicians' safety, particularly in the light of escalating abuse over contentious issues like the Israel-Hamas conflict. MPs are now being provided with bodyguards for protection. But it's not just politicians facing the brunt of this onslaught. Activists, journalists and religious figures are also in the crosshairs. A moderate imam, for example, required 18 months of police protection for his beliefs and received death threats for trying to combat hate crime. And these are not isolated incidents. They represent a broader pattern of harassment and intimidation aimed at silencing dissenting voices. 76% of respondents in a commission poll admitted refraining from expressing their views in public out of fear of harassment. And in a survey released today, more than two-thirds of elite British sportswomen said they would be uncomfortable with transgender women competing in female categories in their sport. But many have expressed fears over sharing their opinions publicly because of concerns they would be seen as discriminatory. With one saying, your career is over if you speak on the subject. The situation is urgent. Our fundamental rights to freedom of speech is under threat and action must be taken to safeguard it. As Dame Sarah rightly warns, there's a growing and dangerous climate of harassment and censorship in our society. It's a threat not just to our ability to speak freely, but to our very way of life. Because if we don't do something about this growing phenomenon, and let me be very clear, from our polling, 60% of the public think this has got worse in the last five years. If we don't do something about this, I'm afraid we will see an erosion of these precious democratic rights and freedoms of our country. That is something that we cannot tolerate. This is what marks us out as different to authoritarian countries, for example, our plural democracy, the right to free speech. There it is. Do you agree with this assessment that our free speech is under threat? We'll open the phone lines on that now, 0344 Four nine nine one thousand. I'd like your views across the board on this one of free speech. Do you feel threatened, intimidated? Are you wary about what you say or post online? We'll get to your views a little later. Before we get more into that subject, some breaking news in the last few minutes. The former Tory MP Scott Benton, you may remember, who was facing the prospect of being removed from his seat by voters, has announced he's resigning from Parliament. Benton, of course, represents Blackpool South, said it had been the honour of a lifetime to represent our wonderful Blackpool community in Parliament over the last four years. He went on to say, it's with a heavy heart that I've written to the Chancellor this morning to tender my resignation as MP. The move will likely trigger a by-election. What, another one? Unless Rishi Sunak calls a general election sooner. I doubt it. Someone will have more on that story as we get it. Joining me now in the studio to discuss the big issues of the day, political commentator Rob Double is with us. Good to see you, Rob. Um, let's get into that freedom of speech issue. I mean, it comes around this subject, but this is accelerated and given booster rockets, I suppose, by the, uh, the credibility and the authenticity of the author, who's really put a lot of thought into trying to get to the bottom of what the hell's going on. Absolutely. And I think it's... What is stark about this is that we have known for years We've had reports about MPs being subject to harassment, particularly female MPs, particularly female journalists as well. I remember very vividly Laura Coombsberg having to be escorted around a conference. I think it was the Labour conference a few years back with was. a bodyguard. Um, but what this report really says is just how pervasive this 
kind of harassment and censorship is getting into society, into everyday people's lives, people yeah. like teachers and journalists, councillors, lower level of politics, local level of politics. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, dangerous. And it's kind of the way that's subtly happened over the years. Now, really, it's kind of being called out in this very, very public way. Yeah, it's interesting, though, isn't it? Because some people will always cross a line. Now, when you cross a line, you might get into criminality, whether it's racism or something like that. But to, in so many areas, it's usually just a difference of opinion. It's interesting that a lot of sportswomen had said, you know, they feel uncomfortable talking about... Uh, transgender athletes in their sport. And, I mean, this subject comes up all the time. And there are some very vocal voices, Sharon Davis and people like that, who speak out on this issue. Um, but many are scared to speak out because they think, if I do, I'll lose the sponsorships, I'll lose coverage, I won't be selected. Now, that's a curious one, isn't it? Because it's not illegal to say that you have a question mark over transgender athletes but it's seen as uncomfortable. And then the intimidation and then the pile on, and then you find out that you've got people wanting to kill you because you have a different belief to them. Absolutely, and you've got, you know, 75% of people can't feel they can't speak their mind. That is yeah. one of the top line uh, facts coming out from this report. I mean, I think when it comes to democracy and the impact of democracy, I think we have to be a little bit careful about this because the great thing about the way we do democracy in the UK, yeah. and as is indeed across the world, is that it's a secret ballot, which means it doesn't matter what you, you know, say or what you don't say in public opinion. True. When you get into the ballot box, no one knows how you vote. Yeah. And so I think in, in that sense, democracy is still very much protected. People can vote without fear of repercussions. It's more about how it's set in public, how it's set in society. Yeah. If no one who is, who, who is feels they have a slight nuanced opinion, feels they can't speak out, it leaves a void. And what fills the void? The people who are happy to scream and shout about it, who might have more extreme opinions. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, the whole debate around an issue just becomes a very divisive um, sort of societal narr a narr narrative of great sort of division, when perhaps it's just because people who have more nuanced view don't feel they can speak I mean, we it. mentioned, uh, and it was mentioned in the uh, Dame Sarah's report, that the Batley school teacher. I mean, what happened to this guy was absolutely horrendous. And as far as I... We, we talked about it a lot when nobody was really talking about it. Um, and, and it was curious because it seemed to have been given a free part. I mean, there were people outside the school almost calling for the blood of this man. The guy's in hiding. His identity had to be changed because he did something that upset some people. And it's something he'd done before in the classroom as well. I think three or four times before he'd repeated this particular exercise. Um, and nothing's happened. I mean, the, you know, despite all of that, the local MP, Kim Ledbetter, I mean, if you want to look at levels of uselessness with your local political representatives, she's in another part. She's in another part of the spectrum. The report she goes, said nothing at all. It, I mean, the report goes further than that, though, because it says it's not just about the MP, it's about the, the, the local uh, authorities as well. It's about the police, how they handled it, it's how the school, they yeah. handled it. I mean, the school themselves have pushed back quite heavily on this report, uh, you know, saying they don't recognise a lot of what's been described. But... Clearly, the fact that a teacher had to go into hiding as a result of something being taught in the context of a yeah, blasphemy, yeah. As the subject of blasphemy, I think there's something very concerning about that. One of the things in the report, which is, is, is kind of getting through in the news today, is that the pro there, there is a recommendation that protests be banned 150 metres from schools so that you keep yeah. that away from the school gates. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see. We haven't really heard much from the government. Oh, I haven't heard much from the government about it yet. It'll be interesting to see if any of these recommendations actually get taken forward. Yeah, I've got a funny feeling that they, this will probably end up going nowhere because I don't think it's going to be part of the government's urgent business. Um, by the time, if they did want to make it their urgent business, they're likely to be out of power anyway in X amount of months' time. So this will fall into the lap of Keir Starmer, who will put on his size nines and kick it firmly into the long grass. Quite possibly. I mean, I think it's... It's one of those ones is how do you enforce... Because the report identifies the laws around harassment are the problem here. They're not yep. being enforced. They're not being enforced consistently. And the second thing is behaviours, how people are behaving mm. when they're confronted with things they don't like, they don't agree with, or they find offensive. Now, the, the legal structure around harassment, perhaps you can deal with, you know, in, in a more straightforward way. But how do you deal with policing people's behaviours, you know? You shouldn't be reacting like that just because you disagree with someone. Well, that's exactly how, it. How, how, but who is, and where is the expectation there in who's going to enforce that? Are we going to seriously put a highly subjective and nuanced, uh, you know, question mark on enforcing behaviours mm. to individual police officers who have to, on the ground, try and have a consistent way of dealing with 
you know, people, it's going to cause a huge amount of problems around that because there's going to be inconsistencies. Yep. When there's inconsistencies, there's going to be resentments, there's going to be feelings of being persecuted or censored. But then so, you get into what is sort of hate speech and all the rest of it. Because if you say something... In, I mean, the transphobic issue is an obvious, you know, very much a live issue, an ongoing uh, subject. And I've always made the point that there's a, a, a whole... There's, there's more than one subject going on here. The, the gender-critical group, as it's called. You can be gender-critical. You can say that, you know, I should not have a right to just stick a frock on and walk into a women's toilet. And I don't think anybody should be disagreeing with that. But that's very different to somebody who's lived their life for 30, 40 years as a woman, uh, physically has surgically changed to a woman. Their argument, I think, might be slightly different to a, you know, a, a man who just gets a kick out of sticking a dress on. Yeah, absolutely. Now, of course, if you criticise one, are you criticising both? Is it hate speech? If it's hate speech, people often say, well, you wouldn't talk about gay people like this. That's how they used to talk about gay people. They're dangerous. You can't put them anywhere near kids, etc., because they're gay and they might do something. So you get into this kind of double thing. What's hate speech? What is against the law? What is freedom of speech? It's extremely difficult, and I think it's... It's not something that I think has ever been resolved. And the problem is, is that when you don't have issues like this being resolved, you're going to yeah. get instances like this where yeah. a teacher who has done something he's done many times before suddenly is uh, subject to, uh, you know, a, a, a torrent of, of, you know, abuse and harassment, which yeah. causes them to go into hiding. Uh, it, it does need to be solved, but I think, to be honest, I don't have the answer to how you can actually police that or regulate that. I don't know how you do it, particularly with social media. I, I was, a, a couple of months ago, me along with others, uh, I was libelled by a, a, an unemployed journalist on the whole transgender issue over things... I never said. But, of course, then, once it gets out there, other people pile in who've never, who never... don't know anything about me or the work I do. They pile in, and then it starts to get really nasty. And before you realise it, there's 200,000 people have seen a post, drawn a conclusion, and want your blood. And you think, wow. I mean, that's quite dangerous stuff. I think it's particularly... That's just on little old Twitter. And I think that's da particularly dangerous. I mean, we're, we're going to talk about the, uh, you know, Kate Middleton and, and what happened with her in Trolls, you know, in a yep. second. But, you know, the idea that you are blamed if there is a story that's come out or that, you know, there is, there is a, a wave of, of, of hatred going towards you because of something you allegedly said or didn't say, or, you know, in, in, in uh, Princess of Wales' case, you know, was she ill? Was she not ill? It's mm. your fault. You left, you left too much of a void for which all these conspiracy theories came around. There's this bizarre situation where you are almost blamed for creating... Yes, a because you didn't because say... You haven't said something. You didn't announce your very serious cancer diagnosis to the world on our clock when we wanted it announced. So, therefore, we're going to make then, some you know, stuff up about it. What did you expect? You must... You know, surely I mean, this was going to happen. just beyond... You know? Yeah, indeed, but it's beyond belief. that I, mean, I spent yesterday morning... There I was, a nice Sunday morning coffee, a bit of a brioche. I live in Seven Ooh. Oaks. You have to have a brioche with your coffee. It's the law. And I found myself an hour and ten minutes later still reading some of the garbage that's been written about the you know, people analysing the video. Nothing's moving in the video. It's CGI. It's green screen. It's artificial intelligence. It's not really her. Her ring's disappeared. This is, you know, we're being lied to. Some people, of course, are making mischief. Other people tend to believe this guff. And that's where we're at. The trolls are still coming for Kate. Yeah, and it, I mean, it seems to still be going on. And I think what, what, what I think is particularly difficult is that, you know, clearly if someone's had major surgery, we know they've had major surgery, and there clearly has not been a lot put forward, I think people can read between the lines. Clearly there might be a complication yeah. there. And as a human being, if you've had a medical complication that probably is serious, you probably want a bit of time. As the former spokesperson for the Prince and Princess of Wales said on yeah. the weekend, time. I it's mean, what people of need. course. And I think, you know, my, my thought was that it probably is something more serious. I think it would have been good PR for the palace to maybe elaborate on that a bit. However, it hasn't stopped the trolls because they're still out there. Very briefly, Rob, if we can. Uh, quick word on China, the China cyber attack. Um, it's a curious relationship we have with the Chinese. Nobody wants to cut ties with the biggest economy on the planet. But simultaneously, these are the guys that are having a right old snoop. Exactly. So I think this is, the big thing today is that the government or ministers uh, have said China was responsible and accused them for the malign attack on the Electoral Commission. So one of our most important democratic institutions, the leaking of huge amounts of data on personal, uh, you know, personal data from people who are voters on the Electoral uh, Register. This is going to expose and has exposed the big debate within the Conservative Party and division in the Conservative Party of how you deal with China. You've had Sir Ian Duncan Smith, former Conservative leader, saying we need to reset our relationship with China. 
Very difficult for someone like Lord Cameron, current former secretary, mm. who during his time as prime minister wanted the golden age of relations with China, wanted business to be thriving between yeah, us two. Yeah. So I'd be watching that kind of further debate in the Conservative Party in the next few hours. We will watch with interest. Rob, good to see you. Thank you very much. Rob Double with us here on Talk TV. And coming up after the break, could another by-election be on the horizon for Rishi and the Conservatives? We'll look at that story. I'm Ian Collins. You're with Talk TV on TV, radio, online, and your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, oi, right, oi, oi, treat, go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put the statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Ian Collins, and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online, and of course, your smart speaker. Now, yet another by election could be on the horizon for Rishi Sunak, the Blackpool South MP Scott Benton, who lost the Conservative whip after being embroiled in a lobbying scandal, has announced on social media that he will quit Parliament rather than wait for the outcome of a recall petition. Benton wrote in a Facebook post that it's with a heavy heart that I have written to the Chancellor this morning to tender my resignation as your MP. His resignation will trigger a by-election unless, of course, Rishi Sunak calls a general election sooner. Something that is unlikely after he ruled out holding an election on May the 2nd and said he is still aiming for the second half of the year. Joining me now in the studio is Alicia Fitzgerald, Talk TV's political correspondent. Um, it's a slight anorak question here to start with. Why did he write to the Chancellor? 
it's really, really complicated. And I'm actually not going to go into the minutiae of the political history to, about that because I was, I've done, I've, someone else did this recently and okay. I was kind of like, this seems a bit weird because normally you do write to the prime minister, yes. but just in law, for some reason, they don't have to write to you, the prime minister. You could also write to the chancellor because right. he's in charge of the books and you okay. know, all the things like that. Especially well, we've all learned something there. There you go. Fun, fun stuff. It's a great factoid from Fitzgerald early <laughs> on in the afternoon. I like it. Um, but it will cause a headache, of course, for Rishi, because he's got a majority of, what, 3,600. Mm -hmm. It's not really a, no, a natural kind of Tory seat anyway. So it's toast again for Sunak, isn't it? I mean, pretty much, yes. So let's just remind ourselves what Scott Benton did and why we're in this situation full stop. So Scott Benton, he was caught... Uh, basically lobbying on behalf of a gambling company and yep. saying that he would try and lobby government ministers in exchange for money on behalf of a gambling company. And this was to actually undercover journalists at the time uh, who he didn't realise who were there who, who exposed this. As a result, his constituents then basically voted for him to have what we call a recall petition, which is where he's suspended from Parliament for a series of days. It was 35 days in this instance. And then his constituents could decide whether or not to call a by-election. We were still waiting for that petition to come back. That yeah. was still kind of hanging in the balance, although most people did presume that a by-election would be would be triggered by this. So his resignation is, yes, it's, you know, it's, an, it's a definitive by-election now, but it's yeah. probably still likely we would have had one had he not resigned. I mean, if I was a gambling man, sorry, Scott, if I was a gambling man, then I think we would have said, well, it wouldn't, wouldn't have made any difference, really, would it? Because if the petition hadn't had gone his way, mm. the chances of him retaining that seat in the current climate are pretty slim anyway. Definitely. So the last time that it was a Conservative seat before now, before Scott Benton had it, was 1992. So it's definitely not a seat that the Conservatives ever really had their eye on. It was just yep. something that, in that big sweep of seats they got in the 2019 general election, that was one of them. So it seems here that this probably will go back to Labour. Another key player in this will be the Reform Party, because in 2015, uh, UKIP actually came in third place uh, on, in that seat. So yep. Obviously, UKIP and Reform are not the same party, but a similar kind of voter and, and a voter base there, so we're expecting them to do quite well as well. I think, to me, uh, my, my take... There's many takeaways from these kind of stories, but what kind of supercharged half-wit falls for the old lobbying roost these days? Supercharged I mean, half-wit? I mean, come on, Mr Benson, it's the oldest one in the book. You know, a bunch of hacks undercover sort of go, oh, you know, do you want to... There's a few quid in this for you mm. if you can get this put through Parliament and get that question. I mean, it is literally as old as time itself. And yet, somehow, uh, I mean, they must have been very convincing or Scott needed a few quid. I don't know which way round it was. <laughs> but nonetheless, I mean, it's, it's the classic political blunder, right? Well, maybe that new MP salary pay rise just wasn't sweet enough for him and he just thought, you know, a little Think bit of extra, it was. extra pocket money I just need a this. few quid, just want to get some new <laughs> Nikes, you know. I do a lot of walking along the front at Blackpool, you know, that's what I... It's all part of the deal, really. But, I mean, it is just a... I, I cannot... But anybody who was dumb enough to not even question the lobbying ruse thing that they got him on, frankly, doesn't deserve to be an MP. If you couldn't have rumbled that one, then, frankly, your brain is not in first gear. Well, I mean, it does happen surprisingly regularly as well. And, I mean, I think the one that people all remember is David Cameron and the Greensill scandal. Yeah, well. yeah. Now, obviously, David Cameron's now back <laughs> in the scene, in the political scene. And I think that was something that people looked down on him a lot for, cause his in involvement in that. So it definitely does keep cropping up. And it seems to be, however strict the rules are, and however many times people say, you absolutely cannot do this as an MP, it does just still keep kind of yeah. cropping up. Or even somehow. as a former MP, you know, a it's a MP. bit of a dicey area, isn't it? I mean, lobbying in itself. I mean, well, David Cameron, of course, what made it more ironic was that he already talked about lobbying is going to be the next big scandal. He'd used those words and then found himself uh, embroiled. I think he was... Was he out of office at the time when it all came up, wasn't it? I, I think. think so, yeah. But nonetheless, it was a rotten look for somebody who said, you know, literally publicly declared, you know, we need to look at this lobbying thing. That's the thing, and I think maybe that's also why Scott Benton's chosen to resign rather than wait for yeah. the outcome of this recall petition. I'm sure he probably was aware that he would have had to have a by-election and that realistically it's unlikely he'd keep his seat after this. Yep. So I reckon that's probably part of his logic for just putting it in early and, and kind of jumping before he's pushed. If we can get a caller on from Blackpool, um, who is a, one of Mr Benton's constituents, if you can get, get on the telly with us and cry while you're on at the news that Scott is going and he will no longer be your MP, the brilliance of this man... 
the, the sheer level of intellectual wisdom, the rigour with which this man operated. I'm sure there's tears all over the South Shore in Blackpool at the moment. Um, if you want to come on and share those tears with us live on television, we're up for some of that. Oh, look, no one's rang, apparently. No one. What a surprise. Really? Shall we move on to Come Rishi on. Sunak? <laughs> Rishi Sunak is spending a lot of money to try and shore up jobs to boost Britain's nuclear mm. defence. So he's gone to Borough in Furness today. Yes, so Rishi Sunak is kind of boosting the amount of money spent on nuclear defence or possible nuclear defence at the moment, something that he says is not just good for us in terms of the conflicts overseas, but also will um, create loads of jobs for people in the UK. Uh, so it's really interesting, though, because obviously nuclear isn't particularly a popular thing. I think if you mention nuclear and nuclear deterrence in the country, lots of people feel a bit kind of shaken and a bit scared by that because mm -hmm. it's quite an extreme thing to, to do. But the Rishi Sunak has just said that the UK needs to have more of a deterrence to all of the overseas conflicts that potentially could spread. So this is kind of the area, it's a Cumbrian town, that's our biggest kind of exporter for our nuclear defence submarines. And he's just kind of giving this big cash injection to make sure that more of those are built so, so we have that kind of saved up in case we need it. Well, 40,000 new jobs, apparently. I mean, so yeah. It's not an insignificant figure. It's definitely respect. not. But let's also remember that we recently had the budgets where the Chancellor Jeremy Hunt did not announce an increase really to defence spending. He yep. said it will increase to 2.5% of GDP only if the economic backdrop allows it. And he didn't really go into further detail about that. He didn't really say what that means or if there's a threshold for us actually yeah. doing that. He just said if the economic backdrop allows it. So lots of people really kind of jumped on that and said that in a time where there are so many conflicts at the moment, we need to up it. But this will probably be Rishi Sunak trying to signal that he is still taking defence seriously. But this is small fry because if Keir Starmer gets in, uh, one assumes you are sort of obliged to continue with promises such as that because it's a rotten look if you have to say, no, I'm not going to protect these jobs or create these jobs. But he's got a problem with his own abacus at the moment over there at Starmer Towers because the, pr the plans that he is trying to put in place for his security energy initiatives could cost, experts are warning, could cost Labour, this is the goal to net zero by 2030, which is in about half an hour's time in the grander scale of, you know, how fast this world moves on, is 116 billion quid of extra investment. Well, that's by 2035, so... I mean, we are talking about a huge amount of money uh, yeah. to get to net zero. What's he going to do? I mean, and this is all after they dropped their £28 billion pledge to spend on green investment. So Correct. Keir Starmer has since said that they're still planning to do all the things that they were planning to do. They're still planning to invest in all of these green energy sources. But what they're not doing is attaching a figure to it. Yet that suggests that the figure is actually more than the £28 it's billion much more. Than, than they pledged initially. So this is definitely something that Keir Starmer is really going to need to work out because clearly the obvious attack line for him now is it's more unfunded promises. It's more yeah. things that the Labour Party promising that don't really have clear cal calculations behind. I mean, so 20 th the net zero target for uh, Labour is 2030. Mm -hmm. So that's quicker than the current government's, yes. which I think is 2035, yes. is it, or something? I think 2035 is the European agreement on it yeah. as well. That's what all the other countries have, have said they'll do. But the, <laughs> the government wanted to say that they were ahead. They wanted to say, you know, we'll do it faster than our, right. the European allies and things like that. So we'll see uh, You wouldn't goes. think there would be a time... There, there would be a sort of dispute about stopping the planet from ending. You'd think everybody would agree on a date. You know, you might think, well, it's that serious. We can't go, what well, are you going to? Some, some countries have got 2045, you know. Yeah. I think there's a couple of 2050s out there. I mean, they're very optimistic people compared to our 2030. And then this obviously feeds into the argument of whether or not net zero is the way forward. Or is this just a bit of a political game? Is this a way for countries to kind of posture and say they are doing the most for, for, for energy security? Is it kind of greenwashing? That's a lot of um, yep. criticism that it receives. It's not to say that no one believes that we should be doing more for climate change. Obviously, lots of world leaders do believe that. But is this the most effective way to do it? 116 billion quid of extra money yeah. needed for Keir Starmer. Um, final story. Sorry, Alicia. Uh, the Home Office launching a new social media campaign to stop the boats by targeting potential illegal migrants from Vietnam. That's not an area we ordinarily think of when we consider those crossing the channel. No, but Home Office statistics show that there's actually been an increase in illegal migrants from Vietnam and, and the way that they're trying to tackle this. And this is actually quite a generally popular strategy because it doesn't cost loads of money and it seems to be quite effective. It's putting up adverts 
in the country of where the migrants are coming from, showing the reality of crossing on a small boat. With lots of kind of very powerful slogans across them. The way I'd probably compare it is in the UK, you know, on a cigarette packet now, we have those quite graphic images and, mm. you know, some quite kind of punchy headlines. It would be like that, but in advert form about crossing, sorry, crossing, <laughs> getting really angry Don't about get angry about my this, water. honestly. <laughs> Um, and the passion, the channel. Yeah. Um, and they say that that's what they did in Albania. And as a result, we've seen a big drop in Albanian migrants crossing the channel. So, I mean, mm. out of all of the government strategies to stop illegal migration, I don't think this is the most controversial. So, essentially, you've just got to find ways to highlight um, areas that would disincentivize people from coming to the UK. Yes. Well, I mean, I, yeah, we could all give a big old list. You know, we are, we used to be the home of Shakespeare. We're now the home of Love Island. You know, that's where our cultural journey has taken us. We used to look at great oil paintings, um, magnificent uh, examples of poetry. But now it's somebody getting their kits off on TikTok. That seems to be where our cultural journey is taken. There's good reasons not Someone to Someone should here. clip this up and put that on a billboard. In Stick Vietnam. that on a billboard. <laughs> come to the capital city every weekend. You'll see a really dodgy protest taking place almost on a weekly basis. And you'll watch people stand by and do very little while people are waving banners saying horrible things that in any other world, any other time would be illegal. Oh, there's loads of reasons you could dissuade somebody. And then get your phone stolen as well, probably. Get your phone stolen yeah. at the same time. You could be, you know, you could end up living in Blackpool while Scott Benton would be your MP for the next 10 minutes. I mean, how bad does it need to get? It doesn't for get worse sake. than that, really. Really does it? doesn't get any worse <laughs> than that. Um, Alicia is staying with us. Simon is on the line from Winchester. Uh, going back to that issue of free speech, Simon, what are you making of this? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Ian. Um, I'm just... Um, everything you said just now about, you know, old paintings and poetries and the things that we value, that has it sort of what I call... These are the things that we value, that you value. And what I'm getting, I'm going to come to the free speech point, but it, okay. it's linked to our sort of cultural behavior pattern on a broad scale. Let me start with a very simple point, a quote from a professor of politics there about democracy. OK, in democracy, you can either agree or, after appropriate discussion, you can disagree and you can disagree agreeably. That is, that is the root, I would say, that's certainly my root, of what I think... English I've got it. Listen, Simon, I think the vo I've got to interrupt you because Oliver Dowden is uh, making a speech on this very point. So do understand that's the reason why I'm flicking to the Deputy Prime Minister for I know this that speech. And right honourable members on both sides of this chamber will recognise the seriousness of this issue, particularly in a year when so many democratic elections will be taking place around the world. Members will be want to be reassured that the government is taking steps to address the associated threat. I can confirm today that Chinese state-affiliated actors were responsible for two malicious cyber campaigns targeting both our democratic institutions and parliamentarians. First, the compromise of the United Kingdom Electoral Commission between 2021 and 2022, which was announced last summer. And second, attempted reconnaissance activity against UK parliamentary accounts in a separate campaign in 2021. Later today, a number of our international partners, including the United States, will be issuing similar statements to expose this activity and to hold China to account for the ongoing patterns of hostile activity targeting our collective democracies. Mr Speaker, you and parliamentary security have already been briefed on this activity. We want now to be as open as possible with the House and with the British public, because part of our defence is calling out this behaviour. This is the latest in a clear pattern of hostile activity originating in China, including the targeting of democratic institutions and parliamentarians in the United Kingdom and beyond. We have seen this in China's continued disregard for universal human rights and international commitments in Xinjiang. 
China's erasure of dissenting voices and stifling of the opposition under the new national security law in Hong Kong, and the disturbing reports of Chinese intimidation and aggressive behaviour in the South China Sea. It is why this government has investigated and called out so-called Chinese overseas police service stations and instructed the Chinese embassy to close them. However, their cumulative attempts... Uh, Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden uh, responding there initially on the issue of free speech and moving into the uh, Chinese uh, cyber attack story. Uh, which feeds into quite a lot of what we're talking about here. Still with us is Alicia Fitzgerald. Also, Talk TV's tech correspondent, Will Guyatt, is with us now as well. Afternoon to you, Will. We often... I mean, the Chinese story in, in many ways uh, crosses our path when we do a regular tech feature with you on a weekly basis here on the programme. Um, this is something slightly more serious. I mean, yes, of course, you know, there might be people alleging that uh, you buy a Tonka toy online and it's got a, a secret chip in it that's going to tell the Chinese how your kid plays so they can sell you more stuff or spy on you, whatever. Uh, but this is something really rather disturbing when it comes to the Electoral Commission. Yeah, it's um, a very interesting story, the fact that they've um, come out with this and very clearly spoken about who it is. Um, the reality is, Ian, um, and I'm not excusing Chinese behaviour here, by the way, before I say what I'm about to say, but governments around the world routinely now snoop into places where they shouldn't be. That's not to suggest that they're stealing 40 million um, pieces of electoral information or data, but the reality is that state-sponsored groups all around the world are looking into other organisations, other countries' um, infrastructure. Everything is connected to the internet these days, sure. so it is possible to do that. But isn't, and, the, isn't uh, the problem, Will, that when it comes to this kind of thing, uh, China are the kind of man city or the Liverpool of the peace. Uh, they really know what they're doing. The stakes are much higher. Their economy is massive. Their dominance is absolutely huge and growing. So the stakes become much higher when it's the Chinese doing this. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't agree with that. There is um, an interesting narrative right now. And like you said earlier, we're not just talking about chips in, in items, but there's been news stories this week. For example, Chinese electric cars are suddenly going to stop when the Chinese state takes control of them. You've had examples today in the Telegraph where the Telegraph suggests that the Chinese were responsible for a load of the misinformation about the royal family. I think we did pretty well as a country ourselves fueling that on social media. The, the, the situation you find, Ian, is we are up to our necks in Chinese technology in Western society. Mm. And currently, to my understanding, nobody is doing anything to stop this. Well, that's the nobody point, isn't it? Is... Let me just bring Alicia back in on this, because it is, you, we were saying a second ago, this is a very difficult question for the government, because you want, you know, Dowden wants to be seen to say, well, you know, we're not going to have any of this and we're going to robustly check it out. But they're not about to turn up at the United Nations and suddenly say, oh, we'd like to relinquish all of our ties diplomatically, politically, whatever, with China. That ain't going to happen. Well, this is it. And this has been murmuring for quite some time now. In the, the Foreign Affairs Committee have spoken about this so many times. Do we or do we not label China as a threat, a, a malicious country, a country with malicious intent towards the UK? And every time it's been brought up, the overall answer at the end has been no, because mm. our relationship with China has worsened so severely over the past decade or so. And China's relationship with Russia has really, really, really grown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Xi Jinping and Putin have a pretty close relationship now. So the worry is, is if we suddenly label China as a threat, what does that mean for our security? Does that actually make our security worse? Or do we kind of just need to keep that relationship at a bit more of an even keel? And the worry is that by labelling them that way, that will not do that. Yeah, we also moved, almost moved in, Will, to a, a kind of Orwellian battle where the world is broken up into these various regions yeah. that are always at some kind of war with each other. This is the latest one. Are we going to uh, kiss and make up with China, do you think? No, this, the point is, saying we want to keep diplomatic relations with China, if 
as all these rumors suggest, they've got control of various technology that we use, Ian. They've already got that control. There is no investment currently in semiconductors and components in Europe or in the Western world. There is no investment in bringing technology and technology production back to this side of the world. So if the government is genuinely serious about this, where's the announcements today that billions of pounds are going to be spent um, making ourselves self-sufficient? We're up to our net in Chinese technology. The iPhone has more Chinese components than ever before. So there has to be a conversation yeah. here, a serious conversation to be had. And if we're genuinely serious about this, the government needs to ban Chinese technology from the UK, which is going to be impossible. Yeah. Will, thank you for that. And Alicia, just a final point. I mean, Will is right, isn't he? I mean, we, you know, we can say, well, the Chinese are up to this, they're up to no good, they're punching above their weight. This was like a communist uh, hellhole half an hour ago, and now, you know, this is the, the, the most uh, powerful economy on the planet. But when you are looking to buy something online, you want a cheap bit of kit, whatever, or a nice tablet, you nip onto Amazon or wherever and probably about 80% of it is likely to have come from China. So we might want to have a pop at them, mm -hmm. but we'll buy their kit because it's cheaper and it's quicker. Exactly, and that's a big reason why I think our, what the politicians say they can and can't do is so limited. Yes, it's all very well, lots of politicians coming forward and say, you know, China is a malicious threat, but then what? What are we going to do about that? Not yeah. really a lot. There's not a whole lot we can do. And even recently we heard that the USA might be banning TikTok, which is obviously a Chinese uh, social media platform. They might be banning that in the whole of the United States, which would be a very, very huge and significant move. Yeah. Then what does that mean for the rest of the world? Do we all do that? And then what comes next? I think they are a bit of an unstoppable force at the moment that we just can't really grapple with. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, Alicia, thank you. Alicia Fitzgerald, our political correspondent. And of course, thank you to Will Guy, Talk TV's technology correspondent as well. Coming up after the break, King Charles's cancer revelation inspired the Princess of Wales to open up, up about her health battles. We'll have the latest on Kate's diagnosis and what it means as well for that rift between the Sussexes and the royal family. We'll look at that next. I'm Ian Collins. You're with Talk on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, missing. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put the statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. 
The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, it was supposed to was another era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. And welcome back to the show. I'm Ian Collins, and you're with Talk TV on TV, radio, online, and your smart speaker. Now, the Princess of Wales's video message about her own cancer battle was said to be inspired by King Charles, who, of course, went public about his treatment for the disease six weeks ago. It follows reports that Harry and Meghan found out about Kate's condition, along with the rest of the world. But despite reaching out privately to the Prince and Princess of Wales, it appears there may be no way back for the Sussexes, royal insiders claim William and Kate have put the Harry problem behind them as they focus on Kate's recovery. Talk TV's royal editor, Sarah Houston, joins me now. There's always a bit of me in that. I mean, we'll come back to the serious point of this story with Kate in just a moment. But in terms of this turbulent relationship with the brother and the brother-in-law and the sister-in-law and all the rest of it, the Sussexes over there in California, every time something happens... I, th there is a bit of it that hopes this is the moment they get it back together and go, do you know what? Life's too short. It's ridiculous. Look at our shared history. Look at what happened to our mother. Look at how that affected us both as kids. We went through it together. I mean, it's heartbreaking when you think of just that aspect of it. Nothing would surely ever break that excruciating bond that they had to endure. Um, and only their brotherly love carried them through. It's all of that. Um, and yet it appears not. It appears that nothing we have heard or seen so far is likely to change. And to kind of compound the misery, they weren't even told, which you might think protocol, despite everything, would have dictated they would be told. But I think this was such a closely guarded secret, and for good reason, to protect the children uh, from it until they were ready uh, to break the news to their children in their own way, that they didn't trust Harry and Meghan with yeah. that information because they didn't know whether that was going to get out there somehow. And I think it does give us a sign of just how deep those uh, that rift is. And, and look, I think Harry will be reflecting on this. He loves Kate, we know that. He talked about her in the past as the, you know, the sister he'd never had and always wanted. Yeah. There was a real bond uh, between them. But he said some pretty awful things in Netflix and in Spare, some things that William's very angry about and very protective of his wife about. And, and I think this might have put some of those into perspective for them. But as for whether it's the moment when that rift is going to be healed, mm. yes, it certainly focuses the mind, doesn't it? But I think for the Waleses, for William and Kate, they will want to minimise any kind of stress. Yeah. They don't want to think about anything else apart from being the five of them. They've got what, four weeks of the school Easter holidays. They are going to be spending quality time together with their children, and I don't think they want any noises from elsewhere, Montecito yeah. or anywhere. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, in terms of the, this announcement mm. uh, that was made on Friday, mm -hmm. uh, we, we kind of heard about it. Obviously, in newsrooms, you get a little bit of notice, an hour or so. Um, and then, obviously, this this huge, uh, now sort of global story. Um, but what we've been hearing over the last day or so is that the King was fairly inspirational to Kate in getting her to deal with that. And we forget... I mean, this is something you couldn't put this in an episode of The Crown, that they were both actually in hospital at the same time for a bit. What, there are, with real, the same there are real uncanny parallels between this. Um, the King admitted to hospital for a procedure subsequently learned that he had cancer. Uh, while he was there, his daughter-in-law was in hospital for major surgery. Uh, she did not believe at that point that it was cancerous, but subsequently found out that she had cancer, both of them now receiving treatment for cancer. Uh, the Princess of Wales has told us that she's having uh, chemotherapy. Uh, we don't exactly know the details of the, the King's uh, treatment, but certainly they will have bonded over that shared yeah. experience, an experience that, you know, neither of them wanted uh, to have, but have found themselves in this situation. And it's unprecedented, isn't it? We, yeah. The level of transparency that we've now had, the King talking about his diagnosis, and, and Catherine there, 
sitting on a bench at Windsor saying to the world, I've got cancer. Yeah. I mean, in incredible. And he apparently visited her while they were in the hospital because yes. they had their own section, yes. as you might imagine, for security and all the rest of it, and was able to go down and see how she was doing. Sit at her bedside. Yeah. And, and I also understand uh, it's been reported that Queen Camilla also visited her when she was visiting the king uh, in hospital uh, as well. Um, and there was a lunch that took place last week, on Thursday of last week, at Windsor Castle. Now, that was the day after uh, the Princess of Wales had recorded her video message, but the day before it was broadcast. And it was a private lunch mm. between her and the king. Wow. Um, I doubt we're going to get... There's not going to be a running commentary on this, is No, there? And, and actually, Kensington Palace is very clear on this. This was very much a line yeah. now. And, and we got a briefing pack along with the video, which said, you know, we're not going to give any details about the type of cancer. We're not yep. going to give details about the prognosis. We're not going to give a running commentary on this. And then I think, you know, when it comes to time scales as well, we've been gearing towards April the 17th when the children mm -hmm. went back to school and thinking that then we might see her back on public duties. I think all of that is yeah. parked for now. We just don't know. Indeed. And just very quickly, 10 seconds if we can, Sarah, Peter Phillips, Princess Anne's son, uh, gave an interview as well, talking essentially about how the king was doing and how frustrated he is that he can't get out there and do all the things he wants to do. Yes, he said that the king is frustrated that his recovery is taking longer than he might have hoped for and he's certainly pushing his aides to allow him out and about. We might see him on Easter Sunday, he might take part in Ascot, you never know, and he certainly wants to do Trooping the Colour later on in June. I hope so. Sarah, positive thank you. signs, I Indeed, guess. Indeed, very positive. Sarah Houston, our Royal Correspondent, with us on the programme. Uh, let's get a final word on the big subject of the day about free speech. David in Exeter. We've not got long, David, but I'm sure you can do it. What are your thoughts? Hi. <laughs> My thoughts are uh, we've got a very, very ineffectual uh, National Security Council. And, uh, Ian, this is especially dangerous because I think it's giving people the illusion that we've got a, a, a body within government that's addressing this problem, and, in fact, they're not. We, we tend to think there's a group of very, very, you know, switched-on men and women who've got our backs on this, and there's a big office with all the computer kit making things yeah. OK. Yeah. The reality yeah. is that you, you don't sense that really is the case. The reality is that's not the case at all. What The, the National Security Council is, is very much a wingless and a toothless body. Um, and we've got a problem, you know, a, a multi-layered problem there with not just the strategy and the thinking, but we've got a, a senior civil service that's really promoting now yep. not one merit, and we've got people with no expertise and experience for anybody to peg anything on within the National Security Council. And, and, and that is it, got... isn't it? Again, goes back to that idea we think we've got some big wig covering the whole thing, and maybe we haven't. That You get the last word, David. Thank you very much. That's the end of the programme. Vanessa's Fett next. I'll see you tomorrow at the same time. Goodbye. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on 